You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. Leading and managing people, projects or teams requires more than a high degree of technical knowledge. Experience and education provide the foundation for success in an engineering manager's role but it also requires a great deal of foresight and strategic thinking. And just like any skill, becoming an effective manager and leader takes time and effort. With businesses emerging from COVID to a new and rapidly changing professional landscape, it's more critical than ever that companies take a proactive approach in developing and supporting engineering leaders of the future. Remote and hybrid working practices are now routine for many businesses and employees, and organisations can no longer rely on young engineers picking up communications and teamwork skills by osmosis in the office environment. The IMACE's Essential Management Skills Conference has been running for over 20 years and offers three days of workshops, networking and site visits to equip early careers professionals with the knowledge they need to make the step up in their careers. I had the opportunity to attend this year's conference in April, some 20 years since I last went to it. But before I arrived, I wanted to find out more about the value of leadership training. And I spoke with Dr Vasilios Samaras, a senior lecturer in mechanical engineering at the University of Swansea and fellow of the IMACE. Vasilios teaches the principles and application of leadership and management to undergraduates and having spent many years in industry before returning to academia, is keen to ensure young engineers are well prepared for the challenges that leadership brings. Before I chatted with those attending the EMS conference, I asked Vasilios why industry is increasingly placing greater value on soft skills such as management training. Vasilios, thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast. You have a number of roles at Swansea University, don't you, in in that you're part of the engineering employability team and, and also an industrial placement supervisor, as well as obviously teaching leadership and management to engineering students. Why is leadership development so important to engineers graduating today? Yeah, hi, Ellen, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Obviously, nowadays, we live in a fast-paced, multidisciplinary uh, environment, and leadership skill is uh, critical uh, more than ever from early parts of uh, the career from engineers. Uh, if we take it back probably 10, 15 years ago, uh, graduates, uh, when they start uh, their career, they're involved with um, engineering design or technical tasks only. And then as they progress to senior roles, they start involved with project management and then further to more senior roles with uh, business development. Nowadays, uh, companies expect from the graduates to to involve with the technical uh, uh, tasks very early on their career, even project management, even business development. So it's therefore, it's very critical to have these leadership uh, skills uh, and uh, we graduates need to be able to communicate effectively with uh, the team managers as uh, stakeholders to success uh, in the roles uh, from early parts. Again, uh, this has become even more critical now in the post-COVID era yeah. uh, where people are expected to work uh, remote, remote as a part of the team. So this is uh, uh, very important, the leadership skills uh, to this extent. Uh, and it seems that it will stay like that, uh, this hybrid uh, type of work. Then we have uh, problem solving engineers. We are by default really problem solvers and uh, having leadership skills can help uh, 
take the problem solving to the next level. Uh, they can drive innovation. They can find creative uh, solutions to, to to complex problems. Uh, and uh, as I said, these things happen more rapid now nowadays. Uh, you have also the tradition. Uh, traditionally, say the importance why leadership uh, development is key for graduates, and uh, this has to do with the career progression. This was always the case. Probably nowadays, uh, uh, things happen uh, more more quickly. But uh, leadership development it is a key factor for the career progression of uh, engineers, and companies are looking for individuals who can take these leadership roles and drive forward. And you have now young graduates, they start their career and very early within one or even the second year, they are promoted and they uh, are managing other other graduates coming or a, a small team. Uh, and having this leadership uh, awareness and the important skills early from the career, they will help them make this transition. Yeah. From uh, uh, and, and this, of course, will help them to uh, progress uh, more rapidly in, in their career. Uh, this also backed by a lot of research. Uh, you see nowadays, we consider the fourth uh, industrial revolution skills that are important for uh, engineering graduates. If you see, we're talking about creativity, people management, emotional intelligence, coordinating with others, negotiation. Uh, these are all very linked to leadership. And uh, uh, I'm very honored here in Swansea to uh, be an active member of uh, the employability team uh, within the Faculty of Science and Engineering uh, and involved with quite a lot of students that are out in the industry and also teaching uh, engineering uh, management. And you can see that the employers, all the first apparent, seek this uh, leaders skills from the graduates. This is very important. And definitely I believe that uh, all of us involved in academia, we need to incorporate leadership skills development more and more in the curriculum because this kind of soft, as we call it, or interpersonal skills have the same and uh, sometimes they are more important than the technical skills in the workplace. Yes, it's interesting you say that, actually, because when I did my degree a long time ago now, there weren't those sort of modules available to students. We, we didn't do that sort of soft skills, as you kind of described it. It was something you learned on the job as opposed to being prepared for it before you got into industry. And I think now making sure that the students are prepared for what is a fast moving environment, as you rightly said, you know, they're getting promoted much faster nowadays. That's a very important part, really, isn't it? To make sure that they've had that preparation before they go into industry. No, definitely. And then it's this awareness as well about uh, uh, all of this, building this interpersonal skills. And I can definitely see this as well from students that are out on a placement and coming back. And uh, sometimes the most important thing that they value is this, uh, uh, this development that they have. And definitely we need to build more, more and more of these kind of things into the curriculum in all, in all engineering aspects and disciplines. Now, I wanted to ask you about why so much emphasis is now being placed on entrepreneurialism in industry. And what benefits do you think having entrepreneurial engineers brings to a business? Okay, uh, obviously, necessity is the mother of invention, and there is no doubt that the engineers that they start their career nowadays more than ever need uh, and will play a crucial role uh, in the development and shaping the future. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and this is in all sectors, uh, Ellen. It's all what we call traditional sectors as well as new emerging industries. Uh, I have been involved for many years with the water sector, which traditionally we it's a traditional sector, as we call it. Uh, but still, in the water sector, there is a need of uh, for uh, innovation. Uh, we have new materials, also uh, carbon requirements uh, that the UK water uh, plays by 2030. They need young engineers to have this uh, entrepreneurial uh, and their mindset. Yeah. There are really, if we call it like uh, four core reasons, really, why entrepreneurialism is important in the industry. You have always the the innovation, uh, engineers are often uh, more innovative and entrepreneurial engineers will be more innovative and willing to take risks. This can lead to new product services and uh, processes that can give uh, an industry a competitive advantage 
yeah. uh, in the market environment they operate. You have always uh, what called the adaptability. Uh, entrepreneurial engineers are more adaptable and much more agile and able to navigate yeah. uh, in different environments. Uh, and again, this is critical in the, today's fast-paced business environment uh, uh, to be able to adjust uh, so quickly. This can be a significant advantage. Uh, and the other two is uh, with uh, really uh, customer focus because we need to remember always we need to uh, understand the importance of uh, understanding what the customer needs and delivering solutions that meet uh, those needs. And definitely entrepreneurial engineers are uh, uh, very good on this. And finally, I would say it's the cost efficiency, which a lot of times drives uh, things. Uh, entrepreneurial engineers are always better in finding uh, uh, more efficient ways uh, to do things, identifying cost savings and avoid costly mistakes. Uh, and there's no doubt that companies that prioritize entrepreneurialism are more likely to stay competitive and thrive really in today's uh, rapid uh, evolving business environment. Yeah, I think that's that's very much the case that, as you said, things are changing so quickly now across the engineering discipline that being able to be agile enough to pick up on the latest technologies or the latest state of art is vitally important for any engineer, isn't it, really? Definitely. And this is, as I said, it's very close in the link to what we're discussing uh, for the leadership as well. All of this has, has so much interconnecting nowadays. Yeah. Uh, it's completely and so fast changing the, the environment. Uh, look at uh, how things have been affected, like in, in our professions from, from the COVID. Yeah. Uh, universities need had to switch overnight in the way that they teach. Uh, this had an impact and this has happened in every sector. Yeah, yeah. As an engineering community, we, we spend quite a lot of time debating the issues of our prominence and our recognition in society. Do you think engineers need to have more of a seat at the table, so to speak, and, and be able to drive strategic change within the business? And if so, what skills do they need and how do they need to prepare themselves to achieve that? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Ellen. And uh, listening to this question, it comes a joke uh, uh, in my mind, which uh, one of my colleagues used to say uh, when I was in industry, that arguing with an engineer is like wrestling with a pig in the mud. After a few minutes, you realize that the uh, uh, pig likes it. and uh, But... Uh, <laughs> The question, obviously, he was a non-engineer. Uh, that's why he was saying this. But uh, uh, I would uh, definitely believe that the question and your answer is yes. Engineers need to have a more seat uh, at the table and to be able to drive strategy and to lead the change within the business. Uh, and we all know the traditional strength for engineers that they possess the technical knowledge, problem solving, the analytical mind mindset. And this uh, can be very valuable in decision making and strategic uh, plan for an organization. Uh, again, to connect with nowadays, uh, there's, we're, talking about, we're talking about sustainability nowadays and uh, we're talking also about sustainable leadership uh, and mindset, yeah. which refer to a systematic approach that can provide solution for environment, social and economical challenges. And engineers can lead these areas. Uh, and that's, therefore, it's critical to involve engineers to set these decisions uh, and business can uh, leverage their expertise uh, to make uh, better, more informed decisions. However, it's, it's very important for engineers to be able to have, a, in order to have a meaningful contribution in all of this, to have apart from the technical skills, this strategic and business awareness, yeah. uh, as well as leadership. So uh, it needs to be an all-around uh, uh, player. And this is something, as I said uh, before, is uh, very important for young graduates need to be equipped as uh, very early from their career uh, with uh, this kind of good level of leadership skills and entrepreneurial mindset to make uh, the, the difference. Yes, certainly the the opportunity to input into changes within a business very early on. Often, and again, I look back at my career and often the engineers were kind of left to the end to sort the issues out. But now it, it really is a very important part of the speed of de developing and delivering technology that engineers are, are involved in those conversations very early on so that they can make uh, strategic decisions throughout that process. And um, the, the whole systems approach to problem solving, I think, is is fundamental in that case, isn't it, really? No, definitely, Ellen. And as I 
I brought the example of sustainable leadership because this is now really a category on its own. We talk about sustainable leadership, and this is something that engineers will drive. Yeah. So engineers need to be involved this from early days uh, in the decision, and that's why I said this is interconnecting with engineers nowadays. Need to have uh, this kind of skills, the strategic business uh, and commercial awareness as well uh, in uh, business environments uh, to drive these things uh, forward. Vasilios, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Pleasure. Stephen Brown is the chair of the EMS Organising Committee and got involved having previously attended the conference as a delegate. He found the conference to be extremely insightful and feels that all early stage careers and recent graduates should take the opportunity to attend. So my name is Stephen Brown. I'm um, chair of the Essential Management Skills uh, 2023 uh, organising committee. Um, I was first sent on it by my company, by my line manager who'd been on it, which I didn't really realise when, when I first heard about it. This event's been running for for decades and decades. There's yeah. lots of uh, lots of history there. So um, yeah, I recommended it by a line manager. He sent me on it, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so there was a there was a call at the end. Do you want to be part of the organising committee? And yeah, I thought I I think it's probably the most useful. If I class them all as events, conferences, webinars, all in one, it's probably one of the most useful learning experiences I've ever uh, been to. Uh, just that mix of, you know, n- not so much hands-on, but you can see how other industries do uh, management and leadership. And then you get the theory as well. And also you get to, you know, interact, you get a bit of networking thrown in there as well. So uh, it's it's got everything for me. Um, and I'd just like to promote that to as many people as I can really that's the that's the aim so like me I came on this um 20 odd years ago shall we say and and I found it incredibly useful to meet people from other industries and um and just get an insight into the experiences that that they've had do you think that that's something that we should be making more of that engineers young engineers should get that opportunity to meet people outside of their own sector or their own business so that they can kind of learn more skills more yeah. softer skills yeah 100 percent. yeah i think one of the one of the main reasons people maybe don't come on this is you know my company's got a training course on communication or my company's got a training course on uh, xyz but what they're really missing out there and what they're actually encouraging is that group think within industry of if all management has the same style, has the same shared experience, then you don't ever broaden, you don't diversify, you don't get that different uh, ways of dealing with different situations. So, uh, I mean, I come from the nuclear industry. First year, we did a site visit to uh, Mercedes AMG high performance powertrains. The way they deal with problems is couldn't be any further away from the nuclear <laughs> industry um, and not that it's not applicable when, when I go back there it's it's interesting to see how you'd solve a problem if you know budget's not really that much of a constraint and you can bring that 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 theory back and there's, there's definitely uh, yeah the different industries definitely uh, definitely helps yeah the main theme of of this particular event has been leadership mm. and and there's been a big focus on that and I sat in some of the um the conversations today mm. why do you think that the um young engineers need that kind of training at this point in their career and what use will they get out of it going back into their places of work do you think good question yeah uh so we do a course on you know what's the difference between management and leadership i think that's where everyone needs to start because I think that's often the misconception between the two. Leadership specifically, I think there's a, well, it's, it's well documented, there's a national shortage of, of good leaders. We tend to just promote people who are good at the jobs without actually getting any sort of uh, experience, skills, training in how to manage teams, how to lead, how to set examples, how to gain that respect. I'm not a believer in the, the model of you do it for a long time and you become good at it. That's that's not that's not me, um, and I don't think it's a lot of the people who come to these type of conferences. So, learning the theory of what makes a good leader, how do I become one? I think there's aspirations for most people that they will end up in some sort of leadership capacity. So, 
the theory is a good place to start. You can apply it to mechanical engineering, can't you? You start with the theory, you then do the hands-on, you apply it to your job. I don't see leadership as any different. You don't just throw yourself in there and hope for the best without no uh, no thinking about it. Um, yeah. What would be your aspirations for the group that's here today? What, what do you hope that they're going to take away with them tomorrow? So hopefully a lot. Of stuff. I've seen them <laughs> taking a, a lot of notes and I've talked to a few, um, which is good that they're uh, planning to, you know, write reports, do presentations and present that to the company. So the company is not only getting, you know, specific targeted development to that individual, they're actually digesting that knowledge, thinking about it and then disseminating it into their company. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a wider thing. Um, in terms of what they take away, I think if they just have make connections, if they understand where different people are coming from, the different approaches to uh, management, you know, improve the communication skills. Yeah, there's, there's there's all sorts of things you can take away that I could talk for hours about the specific <laughs> things. But if they're taking anything away, so I suppose it's just that they're not facing this challenge alone. It's a lot of people in their position are asking the same questions, you know, what makes a good manager? Everyone's got, oh, I've, got, I've had a bad manager before, but you know, what's, what, what makes a good one? What's the, what's the principles of good leadership? Discussing those with people from the same backgrounds and from different backgrounds and churning that around, um, yeah. You're part of a, a two-year group, are you, are you in terms of the organising committee for this? You're, you're yeah. carrying on into next year. So if you were able to kind of, tell companies about this event, you know, not just today, but for next year, why would you encourage them to send their their graduate engineers on this course? Yeah, so you're talking about unique selling points there. So <laughs> I don't think, and I've, I've looked and I've been on a lot of inter-company training courses, I don't think there's anywhere that offers something like this. There's not many um, training organisations that have the the power and the reach that the IMAC does. So our, our factory visits to, you know, Mercedes, to Red Bull, to um, the CMT centre, um, they don't just happen. There's a lot of connections that go on there. And that is a really valuable insight. I think that's that's something these people will remember for the rest of their careers, what they saw when they went on those, those site visits. Um, and I suppose the, the unsung bit is the the, the trainers, the, uh, the IMAC uh, facilitators and trainers uh, probably some of the best I've I've seen. They've uh, they're not just you know, I'm a key um, staff spent their career just doing training. They've been out there. They've been in industry. They've uh, worked in. I, I keep going back to motorsport. It's the, it's the common theme. Uh, they've they've been in the nuclear industry. They've been in petrochem. They've been in uh, wherever. They've done the roles and then they've took, turned their hands to training and yeah, the lessons they uh, have picked up. Um, across them, them years are, are really, really valuable. And I just, I don't think you can replicate that at a company scale. Thank you ever so much for talking to us today. You clearly enjoyed the the last 24 hours. There's a little bit more to go, isn't there? Yes, another, yeah. another half day. But it's clearly something that I think you're very passionate about. And um, I w- look forward to seeing many more years of this uh, event in the future. Yes, absolutely. Long may it continue. Myra Banner is co-chair of the IMAC East Construction and Building Services Division and an ambassador for She Can Engineer. She also attended the EMS back in 2018. Poppy Harrison is a young engineer, DNI officer for the Greater London Region and one of the organising committee members for the conference. I spoke to both of them about the conference itself, why it's so important from a DNI perspective and how leadership in industry has changed over the last 10 years. Hi, I'm Myra Banner, and I'm currently working with Red Engineering uh, as their CFD manager in their building physics team. Um, I've got a long career behind me, a decade of CFD for data centers. It's incredibly niche, I know. Um, but I'm here today on behalf of She Can Engineer, um, an awesome initiative that I've been working with for a few years, designed for approaching diversity in engineering. Hi, I'm Poppy Harrison. I'm a mechanical engineer working for Atkins in their fusion and advanced reactors team. 
I got involved with the Organisational Committee for EMS as part of my role as DNI officer for the Greater London Young Members Region of the IMECI. I'd love to talk to you more about She Can Engineer. Why does um, that organisation uh, feel that this kind of event is so important for young engineers, and particularly women in engineering? Firstly, we are a group brought together from all the professional engineering institutions. And the IMECI has been a supporter for a very long time. So when we feel like there is an opportunity to work with the IMECI, um, we grab it. Um, in terms of the content of this, it's vital. Um, I remember attending this conference five years ago and sitting in on a session where people talked about the qualities that were looked for in management positions. Uh, things like vulnerability, approachability. And it was the first time anyone had attributed the stereotypically female attributes to a management role. Up until then, it was all about being um, a go-getter and these buzzwords that would make you want to pull your hair out. And suddenly they're describing a person that sounds a little bit like me. And the fact that I had never been exposed to it before that moment means that She Can Engineer, with our aim for improving diversity across a range of types, if you will, um, it's not just about gender. It's intersectionality. It's intersectionality, good word. If you can replace <laughs> my words with Poppy's <laughs> voice there, that would be awesome. Yeah, gender diversity is so important to us. And if we can find those the subtleties in it, rather than just saying we need more women in engineering, we need more women in senior leadership roles. Um, approach the subtleties and the rest kind of follows, Yeah, if that makes sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Poppy, you got involved, you mentioned uh, getting involved with the organising committee. What kind of drove you towards that? What got you excited about organising an event such as this? I think Myra's got a good point. We work a lot with the IMECI already and, you know, mechanical engineering traditionally isn't that diverse a group. And so it's really something that I'm passionate about, bringing that diversity and inclusion aspect to conferences like this that are about technical skills and soft skills, but also it's making sure that those are accessible to everyone. And, you know, we want our managers of the future to be a wide range of people. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good point. That it's it's an opportunity, isn't it, for for young engineers to uh, to explore themselves and to find out more. Myra, why do you think the Armeki should be involved in these kind of events? And 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 you know, this one has been running for well over twenty years. I I came on it many years ago. Why do you think it's so valuable for the institution to run this sort of thing? It's what the institution stands for. It's there to serve its members and keep up with the times. And the thing that probably impresses me the most about the IMECI is when they notice that they're not keeping up with the times, <laughs> um, they really do try to act quickly. And the institution that I started volunteering with in 2018, just immediately after I got chartered, basically, is totally different to the one I work with today. Uh, the the entire attitude towards engineering has shifted um, and it's no longer that old boys club that I think a lot of us were afraid of joining. Um, so, yeah, it's one of the most um, prestigious engineering institutions in the world. Um, it's It's no joke. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that as well, you know, a lot of engineers will go into some kind of management leadership role, but they've gone into it through being an engineer. And so you don't necessarily develop some useful, softer skills about management, about leadership through, you know, your degree or through your technical background. And so something like this, the yeah, is supporting its members in that way. Yeah, I, I think that's very important as well, because you, I think you're right. It's not something that's really taught at university on on a on an engineering degree o unless you do kind of a management module or something like that but it's it's certainly not a big part of it D do you think that um the the uh, young engineers who will go away from this event today will will go away feeling more confident about their abilities in terms of pushing forward as as managers or leaders in the future 
hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been really interesting chatting to people because there are a lot of people that have come here with specific examples, either specific roles they're looking to go into or specific uh, situations they're in at work and they're gaining those skills and they're being able to talk to experts in these areas and specifically get advice on how to manage that and how to go forward with that. For me, I remember coming into it, it was a while back, not really having a clue, not having a, um, a vision of where I wanted my career to go, not necessarily believing that a management position was going to be out there for me. And you learn content that you don't necessarily think I'm going to use this tomorrow, but it sits in the back of your mind. And all of a sudden, one day you're not even line managing, just mentoring someone and finding that those nuggets are coming back to you. Mm. So I think maybe the cohort of today is maybe a bit more confident and ambitious than that of five, ten years ago. And that is only an awesome thing. Yeah, totally. Um, so I agree with Poppy. Hopefully people walk away from this experience uh, having quite a clear vision of what they want next and how they're going to apply everything that they've learned today. Yeah. I like seeing how different leadership and management looks like to different people. Yeah. Because everyone's in such different positions and doing such different roles and they're going for different positions and looking at different things, but the skills are still so applicable. Yeah. 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 Myra, you're one of the guest speakers today. What is the message that you're presenting to, to the uh, delegates today? It's hopefully going to be shaped by the questions that are thrown my way. <laughs> um, I would always rather that than try to shoehorn a particular um, agenda, if you will. Um, of course, it's awesome if people are inspired to volunteer with the institution, volunteer with the DNI initiatives, um, want to take away something when it comes to diversity and allyship. I think that last point is the one that matters most to me on a personal level. I'm very aware that for a long time, being involved in a women in engineering initiative would be seen as a um, rather exclusive notion, yeah. um, a women's network, um, something where men are excluded. And it never made sense to me because firstly, it's about inclusion. Secondly, men tend to be our managers. They tend to be the majority of our peers. Um, they are our biggest supporters and they have a say in how we all progress. Mm. Uh, it doesn't make sense to exclude them from the conversation. It only makes sense to make them part of it and part of the solution. And on a secondary level, take that even into our STEM work. So something that makes She Can Engineer quite special is we're not a STEM outreach group just for girls. There are boys in our audiences. And the entire point is so that they see women in positions of senior en engineering leadership and think that it's normal. Yeah. And they're not phased by it. And they're not phased by being outnumbered when they're in a room with... 10 times as many females <laughs> as them. Uh, and by the time they are considering it as a degree or an apprenticeship, it will just be the norm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, for a long time, women's organisations have been about women and raising us up in the profession and, and helping us to get into management. But now I think there's there's an opportunity to look at the um, the allyship, the the parity that we can work towards uh, in, in the profession. And I think that's a great opportunity for, for women going into management roles to, to be role models for, for those coming up, whether they be any gender. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, you've got another another 12 hours or so of the conference into tomorrow. Um, what do you hope for for the next sort of 12 hours or so? And, and uh, what what are the, gradu the graduates going to be looking forward to um, between this afternoon and tomorrow? 
the She Can Engineer talk tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely shameless plug. (laughs) Of course, what else would they be looking forward to? (laughs) No, I think there's the good range of stuff. There's some really interesting guest speakers that are obviously hanging around as well for some of the networking, which I'm really happy about. Um, There is such a range of things still to talk about and some repeat sessions as well. So people that have missed things. I think the networking aspect is a huge part of it. Because as you said, you know, you went, you've been to the conference before. You're still friends with people that you met at the conference. It's got that history. And, you know, there's a lot of people in different companies in similar stages of their career. And it's hopefully bringing some of them together as well. I like how many nuclear companies there are as well. As someone in the nuclear industry, it's quite interesting how many nuclear companies are here, weirdly. Yeah, there are quite a few. I yeah. noticed that, actually. Um, the conference, as you've already mentioned, has been running for many years. I came on it many years ago. Myra, did you? Five years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So so there's many of us. we generations. Been, yeah, it's, an, it's a generational event. You're part of the organising committee for next year as well. So what are the sorts of things that the graduates will get from if they c- come on this next year? I don't think people go back a second year, do they? <laughs> I, know, I think it's evolving as a conference. I mean, I, I've not been on it in the past, but does it look very different from when you were on it or when you were on it? Yeah, it's, it is. Yeah, I think the, the atmosphere is slightly different. Yeah. I think there's definitely some changes in programming in terms of, you know, the world's changing. We've had a big example of that where, you know, some of our sessions are based on hybrid working and the fact that you're going to be working with people that are geographically very separate from you, but also the fact that we're an increasingly diverse workforce now. You're going to be working with people who are very different to you personally. I think it's really nice to see that we're considering that more and the fact that that's not always easy, but it doesn't mean it's not worth putting the effort in for and learning skills about that. Myra? I've literally just rocked up. (laughs) So I rocked up about three hours ago, so you've not got much. (laughs) No excuse. Um, My initial thought was everyone looks a little bit older than I expected, which is interesting because when Poppy, myself and our colleague from She Can Engineer, Laura, were on a call the other day um, putting together the slides for our workshop tomorrow, we were discussing what do you think the demographic is going to be? Are we looking at people about to move into a management position? Are we looking at the engineering managers of the future? And I feel like when I came on five years ago, so I was 27, 28, um, it was a lot of people around the same age as me. And now I look at them and they also seem the same age as me. (laughs) Um, You just look young, Myra. (laughs) So... I'm not sure. Maybe it is a case of the demographic has moved on a little bit and these are people ready to walk into a management position, Um, in which case we better put on a good show tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) There's a really interesting range. There's a couple of people that I've been trying to that, you know, graduated a year or two ago, but there are people that are, you know, six, seven, eight years into industry. And it just shows that, you know, you can go into those different roles and you can keep learning. CPD is important, eh? Absolutely. I, I'm feeling somewhat old because uh, I'm really old enough to be most of your mums. So, uh, <laughs> so, <don't> <laughs> so from that point of view, it, it kind of, uh, it feels nice to me because it's nice to see that next generation of young engineers coming forward. And it makes me feel that um, my contribution, however small or how, whatever it may be, is enabling those youngsters who are, who are essentially my children <laughs> to come into the profession, which it feels very warming. <laughs> I really like that point. Um, it was probably the most rewarding moment at She Can Engineer in one of our committee meetings about a year ago. We had a young woman join us. Um, She was from the company that I worked with before I joined Red Engineering. And like very bright, very confident, enthusiastic, hardworking. And she was pitching some ideas for workshops for the STEM outreach program. And she said, oh, when I was in school, we did this workshop um, and described like building bridges out of um, pasta and paper and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, So you ran this workshop in like a secondary school? And she was like, no, no, no. A group came into our school and ran an engineering workshop for us. And it was the most rewarding moment because here is a 21-year-old who experienced the work that we were doing 
five years ago and it worked. Mm. She got into engineering. We trapped her in engineering. And, <laughs> and you see it just come that full circle and there is nothing more satisfying than feeling like what we do is relevant and effective. Yeah, I, I think it is a nice uh, experience when one can go into, whether it's a school or a college or, or even like today, just being amongst these young people who are really passionate and enthusiastic about their future careers. That is very uplifting, even for someone at my position in, in my career and my life. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really it's been a really great uh, event so far from what I've, I've spent all day here just talking to all of you. So it's been really, really enjoyable. Thank you ever so much, Myra. Thank you, Poppy, for, for talking to me today. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much, Helen. Paul Taylor has been providing training in the IMACI for many years and feels leadership and management skills are a fundamental part of what it means to be an engineer. I asked Paul to share his thoughts from a trainer's point of view. Okay, so my name's Paul Taylor. I'm one of the facilitators at the EMS. I've worked with IMECI for around about 20 years, delivering on leadership programs. It's excellent. It's really nice to have you on, on the podcast. As a trainer, obviously, you, you are part of a community within the institution who's providing these kind of services, particularly to young engineers. Why do you feel it's so important that we have this kind of event for young engineers to, to help further them in their careers? Yeah, I think there's a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, there's networking, getting to learn about what other people at a similar stage in their career are doing, uh, gives new perspectives. I think generally the, the topics that are covered here are not, uh, there are, technical presentations but most of the training topics are more about soft skills and I think that's important because technical skills will only take you so far in your career if you want to move up into leadership and management you need a different set of skills in addition to your technical skills and that those are some of the skills that we we touch on so I think that's why it's so beneficial it gets people to think about the bigger picture and about the additional skills they'll need to make the most of their technical skills. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And w w one of the main topics has been on leadership, hasn't it? Yeah. And so, so you know, you've touched on that a little bit and um, what you just said, but why do you think providing these uh, young engineers with, with knowledge on leadership is, is a fundamental part of these soft skills that you were talking about? Yeah, I think firstly with leadership, to be a good leader, you need to understand yourself. And that, that, that sounds strange. How could you not understand yourself? But we, we do teach um, a lot about psychology and what motivates people. And people start to understand themselves at a much deeper level. So I think that's, that's one part of it. Le leadership begins with yourself. But then the, the next part of it is about how you can bring the best out of other people. Leadership really is about enabling. It's about en enabling people to be their best selves, to perform things they may not have even realized they could perform themselves. But you need skills to do that. There's this idea in some people's minds that leaders are born, but that, that's nonsense. Leaders are, uh, are developed. They're, it's a set of skills. And to be honest, the, what people often refer to as great leaders, charismatic leaders, are not great leaders. They're, uh, they, they, they may be inspiring in certain situations, but in the vast majority of leadership, leadership situations, you need a, a different set of skills. You, you know, charismatic leadership is all about you, whereas real leadership is all about the people you're leading. I think that's what we, we help people to do to enable others and of course if you're enabling others you can achieve so much more absolutely paul i think i think that's a great point to make thank you very much for talking to me today thank you jack is a young engineer working at sellerfield and is looking to move into his first leadership role i asked him why his company felt leadership and management skills were so valuable to them 
Jack, thank you ever so much for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. We've just sat through a really fantastic session on leadership with our good friend, Fiona. And it's been, it's been really, you know, inspiring, actually, hasn't it? What, yes. what do you feel coming to something like this kind of gives you as a young engineer? I'm at the stage of my career now where my sort of next step would be would be moving into sort of a leadership role. So right. I, I thought attending an event, event like this would be really key to sort of ensure that I've got those skills and I'm as prepared as I possibly could be moving into that. Yeah, really, yeah, so. absolutely. In terms of your company... I mean, obviously, they they want you to progress in in the business as well. So, what kind of are they providing you with these kind of opportunities so you can come on these sorts of courses? They are. So, it, it was supported and funded by Sellafield. They're obviously really keen on on development opportunities through the IMAC key, um, and, and they're, they're really keen on funding any experiences that I want to gain really so yeah. fantastic company to work for yeah absolutely we've, we've had a really fantastic session you've done lots of hands-on stuff you've got to know some new people in the room from different companies what what kind of things do you think you're going to take back from taking part in in this three-day event yeah so I've really enjoyed all of the workshops I've been to already I've got a lot of further learning and, and reading that I want to do really things that we've touched on that I'd like to investigate a bit further in my own time. Also met some really interesting people um, from the wider industry. So I look forward to building relationships and, and, and networks with those 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 people, really. So. Yeah, yeah. So you made some really good friends, obviously, in the last 24 yeah, yeah, hours. Yeah, <laughs> so a bit nerve-wracking because you're meeting a lot of new people on the day, but everyone's been really nice and it's been a, a great experience getting to know everyone. So yeah, I Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. Robin Safas is Program Development Lead for the IMECE. It's his job to ensure events such as the EMS run smoothly by supporting the organising committees in developing and planning their events. Robin sees this conference as an investment in the careers of future engineers and a way for companies to empower their workforce. My name's Robin Safas. I'm Programme Development Lead in the uh, Events and Member Engagement Team, that's a mouthful, um, at the IMECE. Um, I supported the uh, Volunteer Member Committee in developing, developing the programme for this year's Essential Management Skills event and we'll be working with the same committee again for next year's one, so uh, that's what I do. More generally, I help a number of our member committees with the sort of research and development into their uh, like technical and other events. Robin, why is it so important for the Amici to have this particular kind of conference for young engineers? Yeah, I mean, this event is really like an investment in the sort of, I guess, to use a sort of a, like a slightly coarse term, like a, the pipeline of sort of future leaders in engineering, right? We are, this isn't really a, certainly not like a commercial uh, endeavour for the institution. This is really like investment in the, uh, in sort of the future, future skills there. We run so many things which are so um, technical but it's easy to forget that kind of like the biggest asset that any engineering organization has is the engineers themselves. And so empowering them to sort of manage and lead and take those steps in their career is, uh, is extremely valuable. It's also, uh, it's also just great fun. It shows a, like a sort of quite a different side to the institution in the sense that it's like a really, really, really diverse audience and really a great mix of people here. And there's sort of such a, such a great range of activities going on. Yeah, we're really committed to this event because we think it's just massively important. Yeah, I, I remember coming on it well over 20 years ago, so I'm kind of showing my age. But it it was very valuable to me as a young engineer and, and gave me a lot of confidence. I mean, some companies would say, well, it's, you know, it's a lot of money to send a, a bunch of our graduates on, on stuff like this. You know, it's it's just a jolly out for them. It's not really worth our investment. What would you what would you kind of say to that? And, and why do you think it's good for companies to invest in their young engineers in this way? Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of things really there. Number one is just essential management skills. It's like a really unique event. It takes elements that you would get from like a more traditional training course where you'd go and have a small group of you sat and you'd have, you know, workshops and things like that. But then there's also the uh, like the really direct networking opportunities with with uh, with a number like senior people, senior people who've come to deliver the keynotes. That's really valuable. You know, people will come to this conference and meet, you know, a speaker who they've seen present, talk to them about it and end up developing sort of mentor type relationships with them. It's the opportunities to do the site visits, also just networking with peers in industry. Often engineers can be quite head down, focused on just what they're doing or the small team around them and so developing like links and friendships ultimately with people who are you know similar, similar stages of their career in other industries is, is really great we you know are really really keen to i think 
incentivize companies to send groups of people here. So we don't, as I said, this isn't really a commercial exercise for the IMAC so we don't invite companies to sponsor it in a traditional way whereby they would pay money to have a stand and, you know, come and recruit, right? That's not what this is about. So we actually, companies that send groups of three or more events, we'll just brand them as a sponsor and a partner of the event in order to, you know, recognize the contribution that they're, again, making to that sort of future pipeline of leadership and engineering. So, um, yeah, I really, I, I think it's tremendous value to be got and also, it's just really rewarding for the people to come. If I, you know, for me, it's great. I, you know, I'm really grateful to the IMAC E for allowing me to organize this and come to the event. I'm having a great time. And so I think it's just a great way to also sort of uh, recognize the sort of way you want to invest with like uh, in, in young engineers and yeah, re reward sort of graduate engineers for, uh, you know, all the hard work they put in. Now, th this, as I mentioned before, you know, this event has been running for many, many years now and, and has seen, uh, I, I know of at least two trustees who have been on this course and, uh, as well as myself. Incoming president. And, the, yeah, a, yeah. and the incoming president, you know, we've, we've obviously benefited an awful lot from it and, and it's helped us through our career going forward. What, what are the plans are, uh, with next, the next event? When, when is that planned for? And, and is it in the pipeline already? Yeah. So no, very much so. I think, uh, currently in the middle of a two year plan to sort of really, uh, boost this event and grow it. Um, so we have reasonable degree of, uh, opportunity to sort of look at, look more towards the long term. So we're planning the next event for, uh, for April of next year. Hopefully it's going to be the 10th to the 12th, assuming we can sort out the venue and things like that of April, uh, 2024. And yeah, so we'll be, uh, planning to certainly number one, just, you know, raise the profile of the event and grow it in terms of the number of people who come. Um, but then also, you know, Having had this, uh, we've got this committee signed up to do the event for two years now. They'll have developed a lot of links with the other people they'll have met coming along to the event. And so we really want to sort of maintain those relationships, uh, you know, and get really more in depth feedback about what people enjoyed about the event, what we could do to make it even better. And so we're really, really keen to deliver like an event that is, you know, that just packs in as much as possible. That's one thing to say about the event. It's, uh, you definitely, uh, it's definitely like a full on day, right? We were up, uh, everyone at breakfast at eight this morning, and then we're going all the way through to the sort of the Q and A's and stuff, finishing at, uh, finishing at about six this evening. And then we've got reception and, 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 and dinner. So it's a really, uh, you know, really exciting opportunity. I mean, in terms of the long term, you mentioned having come to EMS a while ago. It's really interesting to speak to a lot of our delegates who know about the event and have come to it because there's a senior person at their company who, who attended EMS and the people have like a real connection feel a like real connection to the event once they've attended they uh everyone who comes sees the value in it and really is you know so keen to then get more of their colleagues and later on people that they manage their reports to uh to attend we've had a delegate i think come along here who's who's based as pretty much as far away on the main as you can be on the mainland uk in like the north coast of scotland but because his uh manager and his team attended ems some years ago uh, and he you know wanted to do some professional development work she was like go to go to ems i did it and it was great and and yeah it's uh so people because it's a unique event people remember it and everyone you mention it to people will will say oh wow i did ems i had a great time yeah uh, i i think it does does foster a, a very family community and it's one of those opportunities isn't it that we talk about within the, the institution as, as being a community a family and and this is really where it can start for a yeah. lot of young engineers uh, so it's a great opportunity I think uh, and I would certainly encourage uh, anyone listening to to encourage their graduates to, to come on it um, and and just start that process of getting to know people and building up their little black books of, of contacts and and just getting their confidence building up their confidence so Robin, thank you ever so much for talking to me. It's It's been a pleasure as always. I know you're very busy with these things, but clearly you're very passionate about this particular event. So it's been great to have you. Thank you. No, thanks a lot, Helen. Robin is also an engineer from Howden. As a recent graduate, she felt that she was a long way from being a leader in her career, but she recognised the skills that she was learning would be very useful for building relationships with her colleagues in the future. I'm Robin Stark. I'm from Inverness um, at Howden Technology. That's where we're working just now as a graduate mechanical engineer. 
Thank you ever so much for joining me, Robin. Um, we were in the same session together, actually, uh, earlier on, weren't we? And uh, you were you were going through a whole piece on leadership and the importance of that and the value. What what did you feel you got out of that session? Was it was it something that did you learn something new, or was it something that you kind of feel fairly confident about? Oh no, it was new. Um, it was I actually really enjoyed that session because I think. Before going into it, you assume that leadership is a much more management-based sort of role, I think, especially because being a graduate, I feel like pretty far away from being <laughs> a leader. But then it just shows you that, it, that you can be within your teams and stuff. You can show all these different qualities and the fact that it's a skill as well yeah. that you can practice and stuff. No one's just born a leader and you can work on it. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. You were working in little groups as well. Uh, have you had a, an opportunity to kind of get to know a few people while you've been here and, and maybe learn from their experiences as well? Yeah. Um, well, we came down as a group, so I think we were a bit, I think my confidence um, was a bit better if I'd come by myself, but it's really nice to see other people um, from different backgrounds because some of them are management and they're doing this as part, like after getting their promotion or after doing this because it's something to build, whereas this is for a lot of us, it's hopefully the future at some point, <laughs> it will come in handy. <laughs> yeah. um, it, there are, there's, there's quite a, a, a mix of, of companies and organisations here. What do you think, you know, it benefits your company to send a group of you down here? And what, what, what do you think that they hope to get from you when you return back to work? I think Howden are really good at the invest in to their staff a lot I think they've been sending graduates here for the last couple of years and I think it's um basically developing what us to be leaders and go and to progress within Howden and basically they'll reap the benefits I suppose in the next few years when we're all fantastic leaders <laughs> everyone wants to work with us yeah absolutely I mean that's that is really the point isn't it is is for for them to invest that time and money in you now so that you can uh, yeah. benefit the business in the future when you when you head back up to to Glasgow, um, you know tomorrow. What's the the big takeaway that you've got from the the session so far? So far, I think it's definitely um, sort of knowing like our power. That one that we were um, the session that we were in together when it was showing. Because again, as a graduate, you assume that you don't really hold much to you. The but um, just going back in relationships with other people and um, recognizing like power dynamics and stuff like that and building relationships is such a massive thing it's not what you know it's who you know and that sort of thing definitely networking a lot more and getting to know more and that's another thing with this graduate scheme that's quite good as we do placements throughout the company for two years before deciding what we want to settle down in and so that's quite an interesting one to carry forward and just because we'll be in different departments and some of it's quite high up business some of it's on the shop floor with the guys on the tools learning how to use those skills and change them when we need to I think that's yeah certainly learning how to read people and and yeah. uh, you know understand their experiences I think one of the conversations was a, about the idea of people being an iceberg you know we only see a little bit at the top don't we but there's a lot yeah. going on and being able to read people is quite an important skill but even for an engineer <laughs> yes well, so they were joking about um, having difficult conversations so like engineers all of our conversations are difficult <laughs> like <laughs> well, um, thank you ever so much, Robin, for talking to me today. It's, it's been a pleasure to, to speak to you about the conference. Too. Thanks for having me on. I spoke with David Edmondson, one of the guest speakers at the conference, who has had a varied career in both the military and in industry and feels passionate about leadership training and how engineers can learn from best practice in the armed forces. Um, I'm here because I was asked by Jill Dwyer, I've, I've known Jill for a while, and she said for this conference that they wanted somebody who had a senior position in engineering in the army and a similar one in civistry. So um, she thought, yep, yeah, wonder if Dave will do it. So yeah, I, she asked me a while ago and um, I was delighted. So it's, it's interesting that you say that, that you know, you are foot in two different camps, really. But what what do you feel um, are the important aspects of that? Because coming from a military background into industry, the skills that you are applying, are they very different? Or do you feel that they're very similar skill sets that, that can be applied in any sort of situation? I think that's the beauty of engineering as a career because engineering is engineering, leadership's leadership, people are people, problems are problems, um, and you just adapt it to the environment that you're in. So, so actually, I think the transition from 
military engineering into civilian engineering was was really easy because it was through the medium of engineering. We we all take the skills that we learn in the, those early parts of our career. We take them through regardless uh, of what profession we go into, don't we? Oh, definitely. Yeah. In terms of you being here at the conference today, what what's the purpose of of you being here, and what's what are you hoping to kind of impart to the graduates that are here? I think this age group, um, I've got a good affinity with this age group, particularly, I mean, some of my jobs I had um, in the military, mentoring young officers. Um, I was a, a chief instructor and a company commander at, at Santos, so training general young people. And my last job in the army before I left early was to command the engineering command and leadership school. So I had had quite a range of um people who were looking for that leadership, command and leadership training. Um, and I think this age group is a, they're like sponges. And, and so it's, it's good to, to help impart any little bits of wisdom and knowledge. And, and from something today, even if they took one little bit of nugget out of it, then, then it's, it's another thing, another building block within their career. You talked there about um, the, the nature of leadership and the, the importance and the value of that. How important do you think it is for for us and for companies in themselves to be uh, ensuring that their young engineers have these softer skills rather than just the technical skills that, that they'll learn from university and college and so on? I think because there's always the argument of nature and nurture particularly when it comes to leadership and leadership and management. But at the end of the day, when you are working with leading, managing, um, just being part of a team with a number of other people, you need those softer skills. You need to know some people need an arm around them, some people need a metaphorical boot up the backside. But but it's I think those softer skills, those management, those leadership skills um, are important, particularly if you want to build your career as well. Yeah. Being here today as a, as a guest speaker, what are you going to be talking to the graduates about? The title of, of, my, of my talk is um, learning the, the lessons or, or the, implementing the best practice from military engineering leadership and development into civilian engineering. So really, it's, it's, it's trying to say, I think if I was to sort of, the golden thread throughout it is that don't reinvent the wheel. If you've seen something that works, then if you can adapt it for your industry, for your environment, then do so. You don't need to be the next Stevenson, the next Newton. It's about looking at something. If something works, then say, can I adapt that? Can I mold that? Can I meld it into where I work? And, and that's what I did when I went to what was for sender now Avara Foods, is I, I could see there was a real need for the engineering leadership development, career structures. And, um, and from that, I... I just took what I knew from 27 years in the army and adapted it. It's just taking best practice and, and adapting it. And I think if they took that from today, that um, that you don't have to have lots of original ideas. But if you um, if you adapt it for your environment, for your company, for your career, you know you are still being innovative. The opportunities for for graduates to to feel confident and comfortable in what they do. I think is a very important part of, of this process. I, I was saying to Robin earlier on, I, I came on this training course 20, 20 years ago, or this, this conference, and I, I took away an awful lot, not just the camaraderie from the people that were there, but also the confidence to, to be able to apply different ideas and, and things like that. Do you think that that's a really important part of, of the lessons that they can learn from this? And, and do you think that that's something that as an engineering institution, we should be doing more of, perhaps. Yeah, I think, yes, it's a network and you can meet other people and you can you can learn from, from people like myself and the other speakers that are coming, but equally from the other delegates that are, that are on the course. But you've got to be comfortable with risk. And it's knowing everybody will have their own levels of risk that they're comfortable with, but it's, it's hopefully trying to say, well, I can manage that level of risk because I've got this extra um, experience, knowledge, skills that I've picked up or 
passed on from somebody else that, that I've either talked to or befriended. And then they can go off and see their their um, cold delegates at, at their places of work and, and find that actually risk is okay, as long as it's managed and you're comfortable within it. But certainly don't be afraid of it. If you were to give a message to the graduates um, who are not only attending, but, but also those who might be listening to, to the podcast today, what message would you give them in terms of the essence of leadership, the, the, the key messages that they might be able to take away from coming on something like this? I mean, when you look, I used to teach leadership. So, I mean, one of the, the definitions was leadership is getting somebody to do something that they might not necessarily want to do. But it's, but it's how you frame it and how you take people along with you. And you could say, do this or you're sacked or do this or you don't get a good report. But if you're transformational in it is get people along the journey with you, get them to buy in with what you're, what you're looking to achieve and that level of confidence in you. And just don't think that every idea has got to be yours. Yeah. Listen to everybody else's ideas. And the sign of a good leader is one that will listen to other ideas and think, actually, that's better than mine. Right, here's our new plan and take that forward. It's something you, you get better and better and better at, but embrace it. So thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank right. you. Thank you. That's all for this month. In next month's episode, we will be getting the lowdown on the T-Levels, the new technical-based qualification launching in England this year. It's been specifically developed in collaboration with employers and businesses, with content that meets the needs of industry and prepares students for work, further training or study. I will be speaking with the IMEC's Education Policy Officer on the effect T-Levels will have on the engineering sector and we'll be discussing the opportunities they offer for young people coming into the industry with Professor Helen James. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.